How do you plan to convince provinces and cities to sell their land to you guys? So uh, right now we're starting uh, by getting our own house in order uh, and we're uh, launching a, a major change in the way we manage federal lands and I think we've got to lead by example if we're going to make significant progress here. Uh, but we want to work with other levels of government who want to cooperate with us through uh, a single uh, land bank where possible. If other provinces or other municipalities want to do with land that uh, they, they currently own to help build more houses or use it for other purposes, uh, that's something that, uh, that they'll be able to do. Uh, but we want to create an opportunity to leverage public lands across levels of government and uh, we think we can work with those who wish to contribute to uh, uh, a single point of contact for those who are seeking to uh, remove the input costs of land in the equation. Where do uh, Indigenous land claims come into this equation, particularly in Ottawa? We know there's an outstanding land claim, a lot of buildings here that are being talked about, so where does that come into uh, look, we have no desire to uh, move away from the constitutional obligation to consult uh, the uh, Indigenous peoples whose uh, rights may be impacted with anything we do differently on land. Uh, land is central to so many of the issues that have come between uh, Indigenous communities and the federal government over the course of our nation's history. Uh, we will not be uh, shirking our responsibilities when it comes to consultation. Uh, there are unique opportunities uh, to leverage uh, federal lands that may not engage in Indigenous rights, but we still have have to do appropriate consultations. There's actually some really unique examples across Canada of Indigenous communities leveraging not federally owned land but Indigenous owned land uh, to advance housing projects as well. Uh, so you, you do it through collaboration and uh, meeting the very high standard of consultation. So none of these buildings could be sort of turned into housing or sold off or leased off without consultation? Uh, it, it, we would have to first uh, determine, it, it's, it's possible in theory that some of the office buildings in downtown Ottawa that will not have a fundamental shift in purpose, uh, it's possible they may not engage uh, Indigenous rights, but we, we have to make sure that that's the case before we signal that we're going to bypass any constitutional requirement to consult. Will you prioritize setting aside a certain percentage of uh, federal buildings, uh, these units, for affordable housing? Is that going to be contingent on... Oh, if we're, if we're leveraging public land, we're going to insist on certain affordability criteria. Uh, one of the reasons that you want to leverage public land is not just to achieve a level of speed uh, when it comes to building more homes, but it's to reduce the input costs. And if you're going to reduce the input costs for somebody who's going to be building the land, you better be getting a return on the affordability for the people who actually live in the homes on that land at the end of the day. Uh, so certainly we'll be looking at leveraging uh, public lands to provide affordable housing. What's your affordability equation? Uh, there's a lot of details that we need to work out because uh, some of this will involve collaboration with other levels of government, as was the case with BC Builds. In that particular uh, program, uh, we've decided to leverage our low-cost borrowing power. The BC government put some of their land on the table, and they're working to meet the uh, apartment construction loan program criteria, which is more uh, a supply program designed to provide uh, attainable housing for middle-class workers. There will be other programs that we will leverage that would be more akin to the affordable housing fund, but the program details need to be worked out, uh, but that would be more non-market housing for low-income families uh, rather than just uh, market housing with more, more supply generally. The uh, projections for the number of homes built on these lands, you guys 250,000, you guys think the provinces should put in 800,000, you have a projection for 3.9 million. How did you guys come up with that with any confidence given all these question marks around how this is going to work? Uh, so there's a number of different uh, metrics that we've been looking at to figure out what we need to do to cure the supply gap. Uh, most recently, the parliamentary budget officer has indicated uh, that uh, the total of 3.1 million homes is required to secure the supply gap. Uh, the Smart Pro Prosperity Institute has indicated the supply gap is about 3.5. A previous CMHC report, not the most recent supply gap one, but one that was meant to address what would take us to get to 30% of affordability is more or less on par with the, the target that we've set. Uh, so one of the explicit goals of the housing plan is to achieve a level of affordability where Canadians across the income spectrum can find a place to live at 30% of their income. Uh, so we're trying to build enough homes uh, to get there when you consider not only the additional supply but some of the affordability measures that we put in place around increased amortization periods, new changes to the first home savings account or RSP contributions. Uh, so through a mix of supply and affordability measures, we're, we're targeting a level of supply that we think we can get to 30% income for most Canadians uh, across the income spectrum. So, 
Uh, just to, so those numbers then, they're more targets rather than claims of what will be built through these policies? In, in some of the programs, we actually have a very clear picture of the number of homes that we expect to be built. The changes to the Canada Mortgage Bond Program, the Apartment Construction Loan Program, Affordable Housing Fund, we know because of the average cost per unit that, for example, the ACLP is, is going to lead to approximately 131,000 units. Uh, there are other new programs uh, where we had to set a, a target that we're seeking to achieve uh, because we're trying something brand new. Uh, to the extent that we need to shift uh, projections as we have real world data that comes in, uh, we're going to be uh, sharing that in a, in a public way uh, so we can explain to Canadians, uh, here's where we are, here's where we need to be, and if we need to make shifts to, to get there based on the real world data that we observe, uh, that then we'll make those shifts as necessary. Mr. Mr. None of this works if the budget doesn't pass and it sounds like even the NDP wants to let itself be convinced on this. Like, what can you guys do to assuage their concerns? Uh, well, right now, we think that we have a plan that's going to help address the concerns not just of our, our uh, political counterparts in the House of Commons, but of Canadians who live in our communities. Uh, my sense is when different political parties uh, assess whether this is going to support middle class families, whether it's going to build more homes, whether it's going to help address some of the challenges around health care and affordability that the people are talking to all of us about, uh, we, we believe that we can get the support necessary to adopt the budget. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Uh, we're going to need the collaboration of other political parties and a minority government to make sure we can turn this plan into a reality and then we have to implement the programs. So we put a plan uh, on the table that we think is going to serve the needs of Canadians uh, but we have to work not just with other parties but with communities across Canada, with provincial governments uh, to actually achieve the progress that we want to see. Mr. Fraser, the Mike Moffat told me yesterday that the public land strategy was probably going to be the slowest moving part of the entire housing picture and most of the housing that would come online from this strategy would probably be closer to 2030 down the road. Is that a fair assessment that this is probably the slowest moving part of your whole housing strategy? Um, look, it, it's uh, it's difficult to say well, with uh, uh, precision the exact pace at different uh, elements we're going to roll out. There will be some upfront work needs to be done to actually set up a new entity, uh, but we already have uh, versions of uh, some of the, wor the work that will allow this to happen that are close to ready to go. Uh, we will, uh, in the next number of months, be releasing a, a map, for example, that will map out all of the federal properties that may be appropriate for housing. We already have a system uh, that can demonstrate the appropriateness uh, and, and more or less a, a ranking of the appropriateness for housing based on proximity to economic opportunity, whether specific lands have access to transit, whether they already have water and wastewater. This work is more or less done. We have some finishing touches to put on it. Some of the background work is done, but we do have to set the, up the machinery of government in an appropriate way to actually deliver on some of these challenges. But it's a brand new thing, uh, so it will take uh, a little bit of time to set up. But of course, when you're dealing with new construction in particular, if we're dealing with a piece of land that is not a simple conversion uh, or an office building that could be rapidly converted into housing, uh, you, when you're dealing with a large scale apartment building, it can take three years to actually put a building up. Uh, so we think we can get uh, units started uh, far more quickly than that. Uh, but before we reach the actual target, uh, we do expect that it's going to be uh, increasing at an increasing rate and hitting maturity uh, closer to the, uh, to the end of the timeline projected in the budget. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Contracts for difference. I was reading yesterday, and I just I just didn't understand what I was reading. So, can you, can you explain what that is and what has changed? I, I think uh, so. As you know, we have uh, empowered the uh, the Canada Growth Fund to essentially do carbon contracts for difference. Um, they did one with Entropy in Calgary already, and they're working, I think, on a number of others. Um, but we also recognize that uh, the amount of money that they have to do contracts for difference may be insufficient, and so and so. Um, so one of the things in the budget was uh, an acknowledgement that there may need to be more funding that flows through the, the, uh, the CGF, okay. but also that there may be different types of contracts for difference that we may need to consider. And I, I don't think we're, we're fully there in terms of the details of that, but, but it is something that we're looking at because we do recognize it's important to provide some certainty around uh, pricing and, and credit value. There were a couple other things on the carbon price, like the, the law to make the banks change the name. Um, creating the rebate for small business. Is it fair to, in some ways, look at that as a, a defense against what's become a potentially politically vulnerable policy for you guys? 
different measures, even the contracts for difference as a way to shore shore it up and protect it from uh, from. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's Thunder. defense. I think it's offense. So um, I would say it was always the intention to return the money to small business. It was just sorting out the mechanism through which we were going to do that. Um, that was uh, that was announced in the budget. Um, and and in terms of uh, of the, the name and the negotiations with the bank, in terms of it, I mean, I, I do think, and I've said many times that we needed to be better at communicating that people were getting the rebate. I mean, a lot of times people didn't even know what they were getting. We need to we need to make sure that it's clear to people because at the end of the day, eight out of can eight, ten Canadian families get more money back and it works directly inverse to income and we need to make sure that people understand that. Why is that in français sur le retour là aux entreprises si je comprends bien vous dites que ça avait toujours été l'intention de remettre aux entreprises qui paient la tarification sur le carbone la remettre directement comme ça aux entreprises de moins de 500 euh, employés. Ouais. Oui, c'est c'est quelque chose nous nous avons euh, nous avons le, le prix sur la pollution et nous Comment on dit collectons <rire> euh, le prix, mais euh, nous devons retourner. Et euh, le budget a dit que nous allons, euh, nous allons euh, progresser avec, euh, avec ce plan. Il y a 3 milliards de dollars euh, pour euh, le développement, euh, pour euh, l'industrie nucléaire. Pourquoi donner de l'argent à cette industrie qui ne semble pas euh, être capable de produire de l'énergie à faible coût? Oui, well, l'investissement le, 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 euh, pour le secteur nucléaire, c'est pour euh, ASL. Euh, euh, c'est pour euh, réduire les, les, les effets environnementaux pour les, les projets euh, qui ont existé dans le passé, euh, mais aussi pour l'opération de ASL. Ce n'est pas pour les nouveaux projets maintenant, mais, mais bien sûr, les, les, les impôts... Euh, les, euh, les euh, tax credits, les, les euh, impôts euh, incluent euh, les, les nouveaux projets nucléaires comme ici en Ontario. Can I just ask about why we're not taxing the BGs as that oil and gas firms? I pretend I'm a new Democrat here. Why aren't we putting more tax on oil and gas firms? <laughs> well, every second. That was a topic you guys talked about. We knew that. People wonder why not. Why not more money? Why not take more money? Well, I don't know where uh, where the uh, the reporter who wrote the story got the information, but the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers never talked to me about oil tax, um, and I would assume that they would talk to me first. So, uh, at the end of the day, we looked at uh, at a whole range of different things, but I would say it's important that that uh, all sectors are actually paying their fair share. If one looks at Alberta's royalty regime, it actually goes up as profits go up. It actually acts in many respects as a windfall tax. Um, and so, you know, our view is that uh, that the sector is paying its fair share, just like all of the other sectors. We did put a, a tax, as you know, on share buybacks. And that was, uh, the, the sector that was doing that the most was the oil and gas sector. So we, we've effectively already done it. So you guys didn't consider that? Is that what you're saying? You didn't consider? Well, I'm not, I'm not going to speak for the Minister of Finance. Obviously, she has lots of conversations that I'm not necessarily involved in. But I will tell you that, uh, that it was not a hot topic of conversation at Energy and Natural Resources Canada. And just quickly on the Impact Assessment Act Last question. changes. Uh, obviously, you guys are still looking at that. What's uh, what's the latest on that? There's some timelines as well that you mentioned in the budget, but what, why haven't we seen the uh, the response to the court decision? <clears throat> so there's there's two pieces to that. The first is just the the uh, amendments to the act itself. I think you will be seeing those soon, and I think that was signaled in the budget. But there's a broader conversation around how do we actually make our regulatory and permitting processes more efficient going forward not cutting corners from an environmental perspective and of course uh, you know engaging indigenous communities as, as we are constitutionally obligated to do um, but uh, to, to make these processes more efficient um, and the budget actually acknowledged that we will be bringing forward an action plan in the near term um, which will provide a lot more details and and in that regard some of those elements were were noted in the budget like a target of five years to do the entire thing that's a lot faster than we do it right now and uh, and there are a number of things that we need to do to hit those dates so Thank you. Thank you. Alors, les 5 000 que vous allez couper par attrition, c'est quel emploi? C'est quoi la priorité du gouvernement? Où est-ce que vous ciblez exactement? Oh, premièrement, c'est la deuxième phase de notre revue de dépenses de gouvernement. Donc, nous continuons de chercher où nous pouvons sauver de l'argent pour notre population canadienne pour réduire nos dépenses aussi. Donc, sur euh, le 
d'emploi. De, 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 euh, c'est une question pour chaque département, mais c'est un processus d'attrition naturelle. Euh, donc, nous allons avoir plus d'informations de temps en temps pendant le, le 5 000. Pourquoi 5 000 et pas plus? Pourquoi 5 000 et pas plus ou pas moins? Nous avons entendu et nous savons qu'il y avait d'augmentation dans le, le nombre, les chiffres de fonctionnaires dans le service public. Donc, nous savons que nous continuons d'examiner de, comment est-ce que nous pouvons adresser la situation. Ce n'est pas une question de drop comme euh, nous avons vu avec euh, le premier ministre Harper, bah, nous continuons de chercher où nous pouvons réallouquer, recentrer nos dépenses vers nos priorités. Comme j'ai dit, c'est un processus d'attrition naturelle. Donc, nous savons qu'il y a des gens qui sortent le service public. Donc, nous examinons notre processus avec cette fait dans notre tête. A significant growth in the public service over the past number of years, uh, specifically following the COVID-19 pandemic, when it was natural for us to have additional public servants in order to dispense with massive programs that we were putting in place. We are simply looking at ways in which we can save money, cut red tape, and ensure that our taxpayer dollars are, uh, are allocated towards our government's priorities. So that's just the process of the refocus spending initiative. We are on track to save $15.8 billion over five years. In this second phase, we'll examine the size of the public service as well as how we can, through natural attrition, reduce the size of the public service. <laughs> Vous savez vraiment tous les ministères. Vous avez vu euh, que notre processus pendant la première phase de l'initiative de revue des dépenses gouvernementales, euh, c'était un processus avec tous les ministres. Donc, nous continuons de travailler avec tous les ministres, d'examiner leurs fonctionnaires dans leur département. Mais c'est très important de continuer de réallouquer, de recentrer nos dépenses vers nos priorités gouvernementales. Et ça, c'est une partie de ce processus. Tout le monde va examiner leurs fonctionnaires dans leur département. Seulement les plus grands départements, c'est tout le monde, parce que ça, c'est une initiative avec tous les ministres, bien sûr. Est-ce qu'il y a des ministères qui sont épargnés? Est-ce qu'il y a la Défense nationale? important that we can communicate some information when it's related to other government bodies or grand corporation. It's a matter of transparency and uh, well, we have to wait till the adoption of the budget and the specific element to... to so what, kind, what are you specifically hoping to achieve by that change? Like what specifically would you be able to do that you're not able to do right now? It's a matter of transparency. Just. You know, we understand that when it's related to uh, an individual or a business, we have to be very, uh, very uh, careful. When we're talking about a government or a crown corporation, it's more of a public interest, and uh, we could be able to communicate more information. Are there on a le tramway de Gatineau. Est-ce que vous pouvez faire une mise à jour exactement où est-ce que vous en êtes? On pourra comprendre que c'est rendu sur votre bureau. Le gouvernement du Québec attend des réponses du gouvernement fédéral. 
Où est-ce que vous en êtes avec le projet Tramway? Effectivement, les discussions, les travaux avec le gouvernement du Québec vont très bien. On a hâte d'être un peu plus précis parce qu'on sait qu'on a besoin de financer ces études pour le tramway de la région de Gatineau. Où est-ce que vous en êtes? Qu'est-ce qu qui reste à ficeler exactement? C'est quoi les enjeux? Sont... Des travaux internes qu'on doit terminer correctement, des travaux aussi de collaboration avec le gouvernement du Québec qu'on doit ficeler exactement. Tout ça va bien et on a, on a hâte de pouvoir en dire davantage. Est-ce qu'il y a des enjeux du côté de Gatineau ou c'est strictement du côté ottavien qu'il y a des enjeux? Bien, on sait que c'est un, un tramway qui, qui va traverser la rivière, donc on a besoin de, de relier à, non seulement physiquement, mais aussi politiquement euh, les deux rives et c'est ce qu'on est en train de faire. Et sur le témoignage, ils sont peut-être déçus. À quoi est-ce que vous vous attendez? Cet Bien, je pense que c'est important que la Chambre des communes puisse exercer son, son droit et son devoir de demander à toute personne qui a l'obligation de répondre correctement aux questions des parlementaires. Et c'est ce qui va se passer aujourd'hui. Vous trouvez pas qu'il y a comme une forme d'acharnement quand même? Là, il a quand même témoigné trois fois en communauté parlementaire. Bien, évidemment, ce sont les règles de la Chambre des communes qui sont… ce sont des règles qui s'appliquent rarement. Mais aujourd'hui, la Chambre a demandé à ce que M. Feu soit là, puis ça va être le cas. Vous attendez-vous à apprendre des choses? On, pas on espère en apprendre davantage parce que c'est ce que les députés ont demandé. M. Duclos, M. Girard à Québec dit que le budget est trop dépensé et risque de nuire à la réduction des taux d'intérêt. Qu'est-ce que vous répondez? Bien, je crois que c'est une opinion qui est, qui est mal fondée puisque le déficit est, est à un niveau qui, non seulement, est exactement celui qu'on avait promis d'atteindre, mais qui va continuer de diminuer au cours des prochaines années. Le Canada est le pays parmi tous les pays du G7 qui a le meilleur bilan fiscal en matière de dette en matière de déficit. Et c'est un, un budget qui est très bon aussi pour les provinces, y compris pour le Québec. En investissant autant dans le logement, on aide le gouvernement du Québec à aussi aller de l'avant avec son programme d'investissement en matière de logement. Why do you decide a better use of money than that's supposed to give you the private developers, considering how long these processes tend to take in terms of government purchasing land and then, you know, setting aside and having another company, probably CLC, develop it? We are indeed going to do two things. First, a better use of federal land, and second, an ability to purchase land, existing lands from other public lands owned by municipalities and provinces and territories to facilitate the use of those lands for housing purposes. It's, it takes too long, it's often too complicated for non-profit housing providers in particular to have access to those lands and to build affordable homes. So we believe that this is an important plan that will help more, to build more, build more quickly and more homes for Canadians in the next few years. Pour revenir sur le tramway, qu'est-ce que vous dites aux Gatinois qui, à tous les jours, perdent de plus en plus confiance envers le gouvernement fédéral par rapport à ce dossier-là, parce que c'est long, ça fait des années et des années. Qu'est-ce que vous leur dites mais un, ça avance, et, et deux, c'est un engagement qu'on a pris. Et, et trois, on a hâte d'en parler davantage. On sait que les gens ont naturellement et légitimement euh, raison de s'impatienter. C'est un, pro, un, un, un projet qui est plus compliqué qu'un moyen des projets, parce que c'est un projet qui traverse une, 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 une frontière provinciale. Donc, il faut travailler à la fois avec le gouvernement de l'Ontario, avec le gouvernement du Québec, avec la ville de Gatineau, avec la ville d'Ottawa. Il faut que ça se fasse correctement pour aller... Ça avance et ça avance euh, meilleur, plus vite que certains auraient pu penser et moins vite que d'autres auraient pu espérer. Merci. 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 Well, Mr. Firth is coming to the House of Commons because he didn't answer properly a question asked in a committee where parliamentarians on behalf of Canadians were expecting proper answers from him, which they did not receive. So it will be for parliamentarians, members of parliament, and particularly those that are in the committee, uh, to take this opportunity and to ask the right questions to Mr. Firth. You have particular concerns. Do you think he'll be able to answer honestly and candidly, given the fact that there is a uh, investigation underway? This is what we're hoping. What kind of, what would you want to know from him? Well, we'll see this afternoon. This is not me. It's, I think it's, it's more important to parliamentarians and members of parliament on the parliamentary committee in particular. But there Écoutez, je pense qu'on a présenté un budget qui est fiscalement responsable. Qui avait 40 milliards de déficit. On a présenté un budget qui est fiscalement responsable, qui va nous permettre de maintenir notre code de crédit. Et en même temps, on met les pièces en place pour être capable de relever les défis euh, que notre société nous demande de relever, notamment sur la question de la crise du logement, 
l'accès à l'habitation de l'équité intergénérationnelle. On investit entre autres dans les étudiants, dans les jeunes. Euh, et donc, euh, on continue de faire notre travail. Et qu'est-ce que vous pensez sur la Est-ce que tu peux répondre? Il n'y a aucune spécificité dans la francophonie pour la culture en ce moment. Il y a eu beaucoup d'annonces, justement, pour la culture, mais il manque des spécificités pour la francophonie. Qu'est-ce qu'il y a? Bien, dans tous les programmes qu'on met en place du côté des arts et de la culture, la question de la francophonie, la question de la culture du Québec euh, est toujours très présente. Et évidemment, tous les programmes euh, soutiennent notamment la, la communauté culturelle au Québec. Non, Radio-Canada, comme tous les autres diffuseurs publics, euh, privés, euh, comme les médias de la presse écrite, traversent une période difficile où les revenus publicitaires, malheureusement, continuent de s'éroder pour aller entre les poches des géants du web. La bonne nouvelle, c'est qu'on a une entente avec Google pour ramener de l'argent dans le système, mais ça fait en sorte qu'il y a des déficits à Radio-Canada. Et donc, et donc on, va, on, on réinvestit pour euh, limiter les dépenses pour cette année, puis donner le temps de revoir la gouvernance, la structure financière euh, et aussi euh, la mission et le mandat de CBC Radio-Canada pour les Why does CBC get more money after laying off workers and managers still collecting bonuses? Okay, so we know uh, that our public broadcaster, like uh, private companies as well in the media sector, are going through a hard time with their advertisement money going more and more towards the tech giants. Um, so what we're doing, because CBC had a deficit, is put money so that uh, they limit the number of job loss. And so it gives us also time this year to talk about uh, the financial structure, the governance, and the mission and mandate of CBC Radio Canada because we want a strong public broadcasters for decades to come. So we have work to do, but at the same time, we want to make sure that they are capable of giving the services that they're supposed to uh, give to the Canadian population from coast to coast. C'est un sujet qui, qui, sur lequel le fédéral a travaillé depuis plusieurs années aussi. On sait que le CRTC euh, a justement des décisions à prendre pour s'assurer que les contenus canadiens et francophones sont plus facilement découvrables sur les plateformes numériques, puis aussi s'assurer qu'il y a de l'argent dans le système pour soutenir la production. Donc, euh, le fédéral travaille là-dessus. Je salue évidemment le travail du Québec avec, euh, avec la France parce que la francophonie, euh, c'est important euh, qu'il y ait leur place. Dans l'eau. Oui, on travaille avec, euh, avec Mathieu Lacombe, évidemment. Euh, on a des rencontres qui s'en viennent. Il y a des euh, comités de travail qui vont se mettre en place, mais c'est une préoccupation qu'on partage, puis on va travailler comme des bons partenaires avec le Québec. Mais pas la choices in terms of what their needs are. When you're talking about feeding kids, when you're talking about housing people, uh, I think that's the basic needs that Canadians have right now. Madame Martinez Ferreira, qu'est-ce que vous répondez aux gens qui sont nombreux aujourd'hui à dire que le fédéral dépense trop? C'est comme le sujira aussi à Québec. Il dit que ça risque de nuire à la, la baisse Bien, des taux d'intérêt. Je trouve ça quand même, quand même incroyable que les provinces nous, nous critiquent de dépenser trop. Pendant la pandémie, j'aimerais quand même rappeler qu'on était le gouvernement qui a donné 8 sur 10 aux provinces, qui dans certains cas avaient quand même des, des budgets très positifs. Mais nous avons été là, nous avons appuyé l'ensemble des provinces euh, sur les besoins du la pandémie. Puis aujourd'hui, on va continuer à le faire. Aujourd'hui, ce qu'on dit aux terminée. gens, tout à fait, puis aujourd'hui, ce qu'on voit, c'est que les gens, euh, bien, il y en arrache. C'est difficile. Quand moi, j'ai des enfants dans mon comté qui ne mangent pas le matin, bien, on veut s'assurer qu'on nourrit les enfants. Quand je vois des gens dans mon comté qui se font évincer par des rénovations, bien, il faut s'assurer que, comme gouvernement, on est là pour les aider, puis qu'on va leur donner ce qu'ils ont besoin. Donc, qui mange, qui a un toit, puis c'est exactement ce qu'on fait dans le monde. C'est les responsabilités du Québec et des provinces C'est les responsabilités de tout. C'est la responsabilité enfants. de tout le monde. Moi, quand j'ai été élue la première fois, c'était au niveau municipal. Ouais. Puis je me suis toujours rappelée du madame qui m'a dit, « Vous êtes devant moi, vous êtes l'élu. » 
Donc, c'est vous à qui je, je demande. Je Donc, ce que je vous dis, c'est que la responsabilité, elle est partagée. Oui, je comprends. Et nous sommes là mais tous là que pour vous travailler avec les provinces. Parce que les provinces n'agissent pas sur ces non, plans là savez, très ben, importants. On veut s'assurer. Ben, c'est sûr que si tu as un leadership où tu dis, ben moi, j'amène de l'argent sur la table, puis on est là pour aider les provinces, puis on est là pour travailler avec les provinces, mais je peux comprendre que ça mette une pression sur l'ensemble des provinces pour en faire autant. Et moi, je dois féliciter le Québec là-dessus. On est arrivé avec 900 millions sur, sur la table pour un programme qui était l'accélérateur de logement. Puis lui, ils ont dit, ben parfait, nous, on va à côté ce montant-là. Puis ils ont mis 900. Et c'est d'ailleurs la seule province qui a, qui a égalisé le montant que le gouvernement fédéral a demandé. les demandeurs d'asile, parce que vous donnez de l'argent pour freiner l'itinérance auprès des demandeurs d'asile, mais vous me rendez un montant conditionnel dans deux ans, je pense, à l'implication des provinces. Est-ce que ça veut dire que les provinces n'en font pas assez? Ce que c'est qu'on doit tous faire notre part, puis nous, je pense qu'on fait, fait un bon pas en avant, puis on demande aux provinces de faire la même chose. Ça veut dire quoi concrètement? Les embauches, les nouvelles ressources, c'est quoi exactement? C'est des argents pour aider avec l'implantation de C13, la nouvelle loi. C'est pour aider pas seulement avoir du personnel pour faire le travail, mais que pour faire certain qu'au travers le processus d'implanter les réglementations, qu'on a les ressources nécessaires pour faire le bon travail. Comme des enquêteurs, par exemple. Ah, mais oui, absolument. Il y a une portion de, de ces 26 millions qui vont directement au commissaire des langues officielles. C'est mm -hmm. euh, par l'entremise du patrimoine canadien mm -hmm. que le commissaire reçoit ses Combien ressources. Je pense que c'est 10 millions à, à l'intérieur de 26. Okay. Mais euh, ça, c'est aussi une importante euh, expression de notre, euh, de notre euh, passion pour les deux langues officielles. Mm -hmm. On veut que le commissaire ait ses propres sources. Mm -hmm. La CUFC qui demandait 80 millions. Vous avez promis 80 millions au, euh, lors de votre campagne électorale en 2021. Puis ils attendent encore ce 80 millions-là pour les collèges et les universités francophones hors Québec. J'ai rencontré plusieurs fois avec la CUFC et ce que j'ai dit à l'époque et ce que je vais continuer à dire, que si on regarde le plan d'action qui est 4,1 milliards de dollars sur cinq ans, euh, le financement pour le poste secondaire en français est là-dedans. Moi, j'ai déjà signé par l'entremise euh, de mes pouvoirs comme ministre des langues officielles plusieurs études pour bonifier des instances post secondaires à travers le pays. Et donc, en ce qui concerne l'infrastructure, l'argent est là. Euh, le supplément, il va falloir attendre de notre euh, budget. Large, mais on a plus que 100 millions de dollars pour l'infrastructure, pour les institutions post secondaires. Il faudrait faire les demandes au, au fur et à mesure de ce plan d'action. Radio Canada qui dit qu'il ne faut pas de coupure finalement à raison du financement. Est-ce que vous êtes soulagé pour les communautés francophones? Absolument. Je viens de Edmonton où dans mon comté, nous avons 9 des gens qui parlent français couramment, langue maternelle. Et pour moi, c'est très important de voir la couverture à Radio-Canada à travers le pays, à l'Atlantique, dans le Nord, dans l'Ouest et à travers le pays. Et ça compte aussi pour les anglophones au Québec, parce qu'on parle des deux langues officielles. Mais pour moi, avoir le fait que CBC Radio-Canada va continuer, ne va pas faire des coupures en français, c'est sur l'agent. Payments from the federal government to municipalities. Have you had any talks with them since? Uh, that Not camp? yet. I look forward to meeting with Premier Smith in the in the coming days and weeks. But I'll say here what I said before: it's bonkers. The idea to somehow keep money in Ottawa, disadvantage small communities. This is a government that ran on red tape reduction, and now they're going to take municipalities and wrap them really, really tight as a gift that will not give. The new disability benefit, why did you decide to cap it at $25? Let me just first say, I think the Canada Disability Benefit is our major milestone uh, to support those lowest income individuals with disabilities. Um, as you know, we're investing $6.1 billion uh, to support some of the most vulnerable uh, lowest income uh, people living with disabilities. This is going to help 600,000 uh, you know, individuals with disabilities. We know there's more to do, but I do want to take an opportunity uh, to thank the relentless advocacy of the disability community, and we're going to continue to now work on the regulations to make sure that we support this benefit so we can get it to people uh, as soon as possible. Advocates, though, for people with disabilities are saying that it's not enough money, that it's not going to lift people out of poverty. So what do you say to that? Look, I'll say, I think there's always more to do, but I will say, you know, if you look at the budget, this is the largest single, uh, you know, largest uh, single item that you will see, $6.1 billion. Uh, this is around building a social safety net around prison. 
uh, this goes in align with the work that we've been able to do, uh, whether it is with the Canada Child Benefit, with the old aid security. Uh, and now it's up to, and I think it's really important also for provinces and territories to also step up and see what more than they can uh, do to ensure that uh, persons with disabilities get those supports that they need. And we really want to make sure uh, that this benefit is an income supplement, not an income re replacement. Uh, and I, we're going we're to continue to work with provinces and territories to make sure that, that that's a reality. Well, what, do you hear, what do you think when you hear people, groups that represent people with disabilities saying, this isn't going to lift anybody out of poverty. It's not going to do what it's meant to do. Look, as I mentioned, this benefit is a major milestone, uh, a stepping stone. Uh, we did not have a Canada Disability Benefit, statutory benefit that existed. It's our government that put it in place. There's way more to do. We're going to continue to work uh, with partners, disability community, work on the regulations as we speak now, and also work with provinces and territories because they also have a role and responsibility to do more to support those most vulnerable in our community. I just want to talk about $200. I mean, how can, you're saying there's more to do is looking at increasing the amount, something that your government would do? Look, as I mentioned, this is a benefit that is a major milestone to support some of the most vulnerable, uh, lowest income uh, you know, persons with disabilities uh, in Canada. Uh, and I want to take a moment to thank the relentless advocacy of, of, of the disability community. Right, but they're advocating and for more. They're saying $200 oh, look, this is, not is enough. Look, this is a starting point. Uh, you know, we are. this is a keystone in, in creating a key benefit that our government has put forward. Uh, we're going to continue to work with provinces and territories to make sure that they get the supports that they need and make sure that provinces do not claw back any of the supports that the federal government is, uh, is putting forward. There's more to do and we're going to continue to work with the community to well, do just that. When you say it's a starting point, are you saying, are you leaving the door open to increasing, increasing that benefit over time? Look, as I mentioned, this is uh, one of the key benefits that our government has put forward. Uh, but for the first time ever, there is a key statutory benefit that exists in Canada Disability Will Benefit. Will you increase it? Will we're you increase it? Could it go, could it go above gonna, 200? Could we're going to go, go continue higher? to work with the disability community and advocates as well as provinces and territories who also have a, uh, their responsibility to make sure that we lift those individuals out of poverty. Do you think $200 is enough, though? Like, what's it actually going to do? Yesterday the budget came out, yes. there was uh, nine, million, 9 billion that was go going to indigenous issues, however, AFN and several leaders are saying that it's not going far enough to close infrastructure gaps or showing any sort of commitment towards reconciliation. I'm just wondering, what are your reactions to that and what are your reactions to the, um, the difference in funding for the infrastructure gap? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I would not characterize the comments and the conversations I've had as not, you know, um, not at all uh, good for Indigenous reconciliation. Indeed, uh, the AFN uh, National Chief has talked about the positive things that are in the budget, but I think rightfully, people are questioning how we're going to close that infrastructure gap. Uh, that is the first, it's the first time we've ever had a number for the infrastructure gap, and in fact, uh, it was through the leadership of, of me and the, and the Prime Minister that um, supported the AFN and other Indigenous Indigenous bodies to quantify what that is. Now we know what the number is. It's giant. Uh, you know, 380 billion roughly for First Nations, another, you know, 50, 60 billion if you're counting Inuit Metis priorities. And so the work that we're doing both on the investment side, but also on the looking for more rapid creative solution side I think is critically important. Economic reconciliation is a huge piece of that and certainly as I travel across the country I see the differences between communities that have the ability to generate revenue themselves and reinvest that revenue in their communities, um, different ways to finance infrastructure for wealthy First Nations compared to First Nations that are very remote and don't have that same opportunity. So things like the uh, major loan guarantee program with the uh, five billion dollar commitment, I think it's going to help accelerate closing the gap between wealthy first nations and, and uh, As you know, I've been holding, uh, we're coming up to our second uh, economic roundtable, specifically looking at how we leverage the investments that the federal government can make with uh, investments from the private sector and what the federal government can do in terms of tools for um, better confidence of private sector investors to help uh, accelerate that gap. So I think it's really time to, you know, look at all of the tools that we have available to change the way that we're conceptualizing how we're going to close that gap. If you take $450 billion and let's say you divide it over 10 years, that's still $45 billion per budget over the next 10 years. 
years. And I think that uh, you know our ambitious uh, uh, investments have gone a long way. We have more, for example, in schools and housing in this budget, but we're going to need to be very um, solutions focused to get this done. It was right. noted, however, that the finance minister's speech didn't mention uh, Indigenous re or reconciliation at all. And that sent, sent a bit of a message that it sort of dropped in priority for the government. No, so I, was well, like I wouldn't say $9 billion dollars has yeah. dropped in, in priority. I mean, that's a big investment in the space of Indigenous reconciliation. And some of the investments are really exciting. I mean, you know, the education uh, commitment, uh, not just on equity, but to actually uh, leap over some of the barriers that Indigenous peoples are facing in education outcomes, that's really important. I, as a minister, was very thrilled to see the increase in post-secondary financing for Indigenous people so that more people can go to post-secondary education and are not waiting on, on wait lists. And, you know, the list goes on. Uh, there's a, a, a hefty number in there around uh, uh, supports for people who are on social assistance in First Nations communities who have often felt discriminated when the rates are so much lower than provincial rates. And that money also includes um, uh, opportunities for employment training and better uh, wraparound supports for people to actually move out of the state of poverty and into uh, a, a higher level of self-determination. So I would say that uh, with, uh, notwithstanding the finance an entire chapter with nine and a half billion dollars is a good sign for reconciliation. That's a question you'll have to answer, ask the finance minister to, to respond to, but what I can say is the partners I spoke to were pleased that the chapter uh, on reconciliation was, was defined, and that is not only limited to that chapter. The other thing I think that's important to understand is that with the passing of the UN Declaration Act and with the work that we're doing to make reconciliation a, a government-wide initiative, um, we're starting to see Indigenous communities uh, receive money through, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, funds that have been not necessarily targeted towards Indigenous priorities. So, for example, in my own riding, three First Nations received um, the uh, uh, the new housing money that's available for communities that want to accelerate uh, building housing. So I was there in Long Lake 58 just uh, a week or two ago to announce that they were one of the successful applicants. Indu indeed, all across the Government of Canada, um, Indigenous communities are having success in receiving funding through uh, streams of funding that should be and always should have been eligible for every community. Yeah. Uh, last question is, oh, sorry, <laughs> um, AFN has said they want a clear recommitment from the government on reconciliation. So just wondering what your, what your thoughts are on that. Is that something that you support or is that something you think is needed to see a recommitment from the leaders from this government in terms of reconciliation? Well, I think what uh, National Chief Woodhouse can count on is an ongoing engagement with the AFN. And this is something that really sets us apart from the previous Harper Conservatives, and I would say from, you know, the, le the current leader of the Conservative Party. We have made a meeting with Indigenous partners a priority, and in a formalized structure way, where Indigenous uh, leaders have an opportunity uh, multiple times a year, but at least once a year with the Prime Minister to come together to talk about that commitment, to talk about uh, what's working well, what's not working well, and what the expectations are going into the next year. And so whether it's uh, the ICPC with the Inuit, uh, regular Métis, Crown Partnership Table, and now with a renewed AFN and the AFN Crown Partnership Table, I think that uh, Chief Woodhouse will get that commitment, uh, especially through those formalized processes. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Investment in Indigenous priorities. I think it's a very good budget. Uh, focuses on affordability, on affordable housing, and uh, uh, growing the economy of the future. And there, there are, there is a significant investment in Indigenous communities. Continuing on our pattern over the last uh, eight years of of investing in Indigenous communities and in health, mental health, and education. Uh, we are making progress, but the gaps are large. That's the, that's the real issue. The gaps are so large from past governments not investing what they should have in uh, Indigenous communities, but we are making progress. We'll continue to invest. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. So I understand that you will be the minister charged with shepherding this new right to disconnect uh, initiative that's in there. So I'd like some details, but before I do that, do you text or email your staff after hours? And do you ever think about the unfairness of that?
As a former staffer, I think about that all the time. Um, and I worked for some pretty demanding bosses. So I email after hours, uh, and it's explicit that there's no need to reply until working hours begin. And I have shed my morning shift hours, so I'm much more civilized about when I begin the day. I do go a little late, but usually after around 6, 7 o'clock, if uh, I'm emailing, I'm not texting. Okay, so you're a good boss. There might be some other bosses. I'm looking over at like some of my staff are here, and that's difficult, I'm sure, for them right now. But I would like to think I do my level best. If you get a text from me late at night, it's, yeah. things aren't good. Okay, so how is this going to work in reality to police bad bosses? How, give me your sense of how we're going to see this come into effect. Well, I think the most important thing is workplaces get to determine that themselves, and employers and employees will get to determine that themselves. What we're putting out there is that employees should have a right to disconnect. And just to be clear, this is for federally regulated workplaces. This is, you know, roughly about 6% of, of workers uh, that fall under our jurisdiction, which is generally transportation, uh, banking, and telecommunications. Um, and so for employees who fall within that, we are going to work on a right to disconnect. Um, and that's something that, you know, workplaces will, will work out themselves, but it's really important that we start this. And, uh, and we will ask those workplaces, hey, can we, you know, take a look at your plan? But they'll develop those plans themselves. I mean, I'm, I'm not one who's, who thinks that the federal government particularly should be doctrinaire about how workplaces are run. We just want to, we want people to start talking about this. This is a different workplace environment than when even I was a staffer. Um, because, you know, then generally it was a phone call. We're talking about even pre-Blackberry. We're talking the late 90s. So, you know, a, it, a phone call late at night is, is a very different thing than a boss just texting you and then an employee feeling the onus, oh my gosh, am I always on call? Like, that's not good for your mental health. It really isn't. And I really, I think that this speaks to um, generations of workers now that are far more literate, thankfully, about mental health and stress um, than we ever were. And so I think it, this time has come. They, they've tried it in other countries, and it's worked well in Belgium and in France. And we're looking at that carefully. But one thing that I was, uh, I demanded very early on is that workplaces, the onus, you know, workplaces should be able to generate these, these things themselves. Employees with their employers should be able to do this themselves. Uh, this sort of thing, guidelines, whatever will come out. We're working it out now. We're working it out now, but but it's really important that it's it's out there. Um, you know, this is something that we campaigned on. Uh, this is not a new policy, but it is something that we are going to start putting into effect. Which just means, tell us how you're going to go about this, and and the awareness of employees that they have a right to ask for this. You pointed out how it's six percent of the Canadian population or, or the workforce. The workforce. Yeah. Um, are you hoping the private sector becomes inspired by what you're doing? Like, how do you see this thing spreading? So this is the private sector uh, in the provinces and territories. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've done this in area, other areas too. You, hopefully you lead by example. We're doing that on paid sick leave. Um, we're doing that on, uh, on, rep on a replacement worker ban. Um, you lead by example. We're in a position where we feel strongly about this. We want to do it. We're also, frankly, you know, this is an issue of fairness, and I think of, uh, but it's also an issue of just practicality. We have a massive labor shortage. Uh, we want to attract people to these industries and make sure that they're working in telecommunications and in banking. And, you know, we want to make sure that they're there. These are, these are ways that you can keep employees happy and retain them. Um, but, you know, it's really important that you allow as much flexibility as you can uh, to employers and employees to arrive at these solutions themselves as opposed to the federal government being overly prescriptive. Mr. King, can clarify there? Is this like a, a regulation? Is this going to be a change to the Canada Labor Code? Because I know there's provisions in there right now, correct me if I'm wrong, where you have to give like at least an eight hour break for employees in between shifts and something like a, you know, sorry, I'm sure like a 96 hour notice changing schedules. And I assume if you contact or you text your employees, tell them to do something within that eight hour limit, it would be against the Canada Labor Code. So, can you explain? Yeah, right, right now at this stage of the game, what we're just asking for is, look, you know, workplaces should have a plan. Uh, how are you going to deal with this? Tell us, you know, uh, how things are going between employers and employees on this. Uh, I, I give the benefit of the doubt to employers and to employees. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, a, a lot of people will probably arrive at this themselves. And, pro you know, provinces and territories which dictate 94 percent, you know, they'll, they'll dictate this themselves as well. Um, but, you know, this is something that we believe... We believe its time has come. Uh, it's just we're still playing catch up to a very different work reality where, you know, a boss can tell you 24-7. I mean, I'd, 
I, you know, I wake up in the middle of the night with uh, great ideas, but you know, I wouldn't grab the phone and call somebody. But you know, I would, it's possible you could text or email, and you want to make sure that it's very clear. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to respond right away. It means that when you get in at 9 or 10 o'clock, or whatever the case may be, that this is something you should deal with. You know, maybe if I was more civilized, I'd just do a to-do list and write it out again. Anyway, but you know, this is what we do, and it's just really important that everybody understands that there's a comfort level with this. Um, you know, I've been attuned to uh, mental health. I was a champion of it uh, for, you know, for, for a long time and, uh, and I've been through a few things myself and I'm just very attuned to this. Uh, you know, wherever you could just decrease anxiety in people's lives, let's do it. My Atlantic Canadian newsroom friends, Premier Fury seems to suggest that federal policy that federal policy I'll put it another way. The voters in Fogo Island were voting against the federal liberals. They weren't voting for the provincial PCs. That seems to be the between the lines of what Premier Ferry suggests. Some thoughts about that? I wasn't at the doors. I mean, um, you know, uh, so I, I don't know what people were saying. I got a, you know, a fair idea. There, there are a lot of, there are a lot of issues. There's always a lot of issues. There's very rarely a singular issue. Uh, I'm not immune to the fact that you know uh, the price on pollution is fairly controversial, and I also understand it's you know it's controversial in rural areas. But that's also an area that's very dependent on the fishery too. There's been complications on the fishery in in the province as well. There's a lot of reasons. Um, you know these are these are liberals. I you know. Uh, friends who, who are knocking on those doors, uh, you know, this is a, this is a, uh, some I feel as well, right? And, I, and I'm still reading the tea leaves on it, but I can guarantee you there was no single reason. I just wanted to ask you, and I'm sorry, I've turned a little late, um, there is a price tag to this rights to disconnect in the budget, it's uh, costing millions of dollars, what exactly is that money going to do? That money is going to help administer it. I mean, you know, you need to have people and full-time employees who are going to you know, take a look. We've got a lot of, even though, you know, it sounds small, 6% of the workforce, it's a lot of businesses, uh, hundreds of thousands of employees. So, you know, you've you got to be able to take a look at, at the plans that they have in their individual workplaces to make sure that they strike that balance and allow people the right to disconnect. And how is this going to be enforced, honestly? I mean, when you just look at, you know, working in a federally regulated workplace, um, there's often things that kind of toe the line a little bit. How is this government actually going to be able to Beginning by giving people the benefit of the doubt. Uh, employers have been through, uh, in federally regulated space, have been through an awful lot of change and churn uh, that we've thrown at them um, on a lot of different issues. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they've, you know, we've had ups and downs on that, obviously, because there is a lot of change. But, um, Let's see, about, let's see the plans that they come up with their, with their employees. I really do not want to be overly prescriptive on it. We just want to make sure that each workplace has a plan that allows people to disconnect uh, without, it, you know, without them being judged, against, judged by professionally. Um, you know, I, I give people the benefit of the doubt. And, and I, like I said, these workplaces have been through an, a great deal of change lately, and I'm sure that they will handle this well, uh, where they don't, well, we'll get to that when we come to Have you given them a timeline on how, how long it'll take for them to present to you this plan? Not just yet, but, um, but you know, this is something we're asking for right now, and we'll get there. Do you really Thanks, all want uh, productivity-related pushback from employers, like people coming to you and saying you, you're meddling into their business? And... No, I mean, we're just saying that we, we think employees should have a right to dis disconnect because of productivity. If people are strung out and not getting enough sleep and they're on edge all the time, they're not going to be productive despite the behavior of sometimes members of parliament. <laughs> you know, people deserve that right, I think. We are living in a very different world. I think that labor laws, procedures, processes, priorities need to catch up. If we are going to retain good people in very, very important jurisdictions in this country, we need to make sure that they are treated well. And, and you know, I think this is something, this is a conversation all employees should be having with their employers, and employers should be having with their employees to retain them, to keep them. You know, this is a very real issue, and in jurisdictions where they've put it in, like I said, in Belgium, France, and other places, um, you know, the response has been good. So we want people, let, let's begin by having this chat, and, and people individually in, in their workplaces ascribing certain rules and conditions. I think that's just a mature relationship. How do you, how do you respond to um, sectors who might, or employers who might say, well, this is just another example of government overreach. Let us lead our offices and our, and our businesses how we choose to do this. I mean, we regulate, you know, we, we put in occupational health and safety, thank goodness, um, you know, we've been doing that for quite some time. We do that because we need to, because, you know, employees have certain rights. Um, and, you know, 
you try and not meddle any more than you have to, but you know, government has to make sure that we look after those people who are vulnerable. Um, we want to make sure that workers enjoy the rights that they deserve. And this is, uh, I think, a very 21st century policy. And so to make that comparison, this is an issue of health and safety. Yeah, definitely mental health, most definitely. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. On the PND and Canada Post property, um, how do you intend to lease out that land to developers? Like, how long would that be for? Uh, the idea that we're trying to promote here is to uh, have a, enough of a uh, enough runway on the lease that we can actually uh, meet or exceed the life cycle of the, the buildings that will be constructed. So these are intended to be long-term leases that will allow someone who's going to make the investment in a project to actually build it uh, to know that the project will actually work uh, when they look at the math. Uh, so we have uh, obviously uh, a need to go uh, develop and unveil the program details, uh, but the idea is this is going to involve long term leases where the federal government can maintain ownership, keep public lands public, but remove the input costs of land to the extent possible uh, when you're trying to figure out whether the math of a project will work uh, when you're looking at the pro formas to determine whether the project pencils. Okay, look, sorry to run guys. Uh, okay. 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 Yeah, is that something that you've been pushing for? In, in yeah, absolutely. 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 Okay. Is that, are there any other liberals as well who has been kind of hoping that their constituents get included in that? Yeah, I think there's quite a few people who were in that category that have at least parts of their writings, especially places which don't have natural gas, don't have public transport, mm -hmm. but they're still considered urban, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. So I'm really happy that's going to change. Is there a specific recommendation that you have for how they could amend it to make it you know, better, or, or what exactly do you hope? Well, I, I think, and I think they're looking at how to amend it to make it more equitable for those kind of people, but I think certainly if you don't have access to natural gas, you're dependent on propane or oil. So I think that should be one of the factors, but also whether there's public transport transport. I mean, I think those are maybe more important factors than whether you're considered a metropolitan area. Mm. I know you've, you've kind of pushed, pushed been pushing on this before for a while. Has that kind of, I guess, hindered your support in consumer carbon pricing before because you thought it might have been inequitable? Or P possibly, because if, if people think that the tax isn't fair, then, then that's going to hurt you. And it's a, it's a matter of good governance. You should be fair to people. If you're rural, you should get the rebate. If you're not rural, you shouldn't get... So um, I think it's just a matter of fairness, and people certainly are, are aware of those kind of things. Okay, thank you. Is that it's not the flood mapping piece. It's working actually with the province and territory to get this uh, the, the balance right on what we need to do. So that's what we're we're, we're going to be doing now. Is uh, I mean we know the impact of climate change that uh, that we're having to deal with. And as we talk about flooding, we all I want to remind people is flash flooding is also a significant issue now. So even though right now that the snowpack is lower and the flooding issue might be less, right? but certain, certain parts of the country are still going to have to do with flooding. I'm kind of worried about the uh, northern Ontario and southern Quebec right now. But flash flooding is becoming a significant uh, concern. But the, when it comes to the insurance, uh, this will give us time to work with the province and territories to get that uh, the, the balance piece right. Do we expect that we're going to have to expand national flood insurance to include other things like wildfires at some point? We're, we're already looking at things. Um, I would say that... Uh, uh, the discussion has started when it comes to well, uh, because as we're looking at as we're looking at uh, flood mapping uh, issues, right? When it comes to wildfires, we do need to be mindful of um, uh, how Fire Smart actually works. The Fire Smart is not just about having the right materials in your homes; it's also about having the right vegetation. So we're putting some signs behind uh, to take a look at which communities, what type of vegetation needs to be done, where, wh what type of clearance, and and and, uh, and how residential neighborhoods can be built into this. West Kelowna was, I think, a really good example of where where we had good fire smart that took place um, and uh, the fire did not spread, where places that it didn't, the fire did spread. And sorry, one point I just want to point out since we've had you uh, here is um, uh, 
FireSmart is also about the regrowth of vegetation very quickly because when when it's FireSmart is not done, the soil basically gets distorted about four feet deep. So yes, we're looking at that, but I would say we're also even looking at uh, having discussion about earthquake. Well. Right, because I'm already hearing about uh, particularly tourism operators who are struggling to get fire insurance mm -hmm. in certain areas. Is yes. that something the government is looking to help? Well, they, we're putting all that into, in, into consideration. So those discussions, we want to make sure that we get the flood insurance right, and that's where we're going to be the discussions now with uh, the province and, and territories. But we've ha we have already just started the, uh, the discussion, uh, or the conversation at least, when it comes to wildfires and earthquakes as well. Well, oh yeah, that's uh, that's obviously um, a, a part of it, right? And making sure that everybody is covered. As you know, right now, we through the DFA, we cover ninety. Uh, Part of this is this is part of a much wider plan where, where we're looking at how do we do proper um, uh, mitigation uh, as well. So the people who you know where the data was not there and people have built there, we want to make sure that they're uh, they are supported. But at the same time, uh, where there is uh, flooding, that we don't start building on places where there's going to be potential flooding as well. A great discussion and uh, the last provincial territorial meeting that we had actually did uh, we had a very good discussion on. This. But I want to stress and uh, very strongly on this is we're talking about climate change here, right? And to, to get this done, we need, you know, we're working with the province and territories and every one of them are having a very good uh, discussion. So anybody politicians that are currently out there that talking about the climate change does not exist, we need, to, we, need, we need to call that out as well. Okay, thank you. Paul, <laughs> Pour quelqu'un qui dit vouloir faire de la politique autrement, je trouve ça profondément décevant et même inquiétant. Exécution, déportation. Là, on arrive à un autre niveau de langage où on introduit des termes de violence. Et je me reconnais pas là-dedans, je reconnais pas le Québec ni le Canada d'aujourd'hui. Il y a 200 qui a 200 ans, qui s'est passé, ben. qu'est-ce qui s'est passé il y a 200 ans, absolument. Il y a eu des moments très noirs dans notre histoire. Les, les Acadiens ont été aussi déportés en 1755. Mais le Québec a eu des grands moments de brillance, de lumière, de clarté, de succès économique, de succès culturel, de rayonnement sur le monde. C'est à ce Québec-là qu'on vit aujourd'hui. Mais quel est le problème entre énonce, avec énoncer, le fait d'énoncer des vérités historiques? Parce qu'on associe des moments noirs d'un passé lointain à la situation d'aujourd'hui. Et de dire que Ottawa veut volontairement écraser le Québec, vous pensez vraiment que moi je viens ici, là, que Mélanie Joly, que François-Philippe Champagne, que nous tous, on vient ici là, pour trouver une façon comme à taper sur le Québec. Nous, qui sommes tout aussi Québécois, que quiconque d'autre, qui aimons le Québec profondément, qui nous battons pour le Québec à chaque jour, je ne me reconnais pas dans ça. Si vous sortez aujourd'hui que vous sentez le, le, le besoin de répliquer si fortement, est-ce que c'est quelque part ça vous inquiète que ce discours-là porte, qu'il soit vrai ou non, non. que ce discours-là... Je ne m'inquiète pas à ce qu'il porte, parce que je pense même qu'il va nuire à la cause souverainiste. Ce que je m'inquiète, c'est pour la cohésion sociale. C'est qu'on introduise des éléments aussi violents que de déportations et exécutions qui ont trait à des moments sombres de notre histoire il y a des centaines d'années. Je trouve ça très inquiétant. Est-ce que M. Trudeau devrait s'excuser pour la déportation des Acadiens? Je trouve que ça a été un moment, écoutez ça, c'est une discussion à avoir, mais ça a été un moment extrêmement sombre aussi de l'histoire du, du, du Canada, comme d'autres qu'on a vu à certains moments. Mais le Québec dans lequel on évolue aujourd'hui, dans lequel vous, vous posez vos questions puis vous travaillez aujourd'hui, c'est pas le Québec d'antan. C'est le Québec qui a su réussir, quand on pense à Québec Inc., qu'on pense à nos succès connus à l'échelle mondiale, à, à, dans, sous le plan sportif, sous le plan culturel, partout. Mais amener des éléments aussi radicaux dans un discours, des discussions, parler de déportation, parler du fait qu'Ottawa veut taper sur le Québec, alors que chaque jour, moi, que je viens ici, je viens pour défendre le Québec, comme fier Québécois, il y a un dérapage dans le discours. Est-ce que vous lui demandez de présenter des excuses à PSP? Oui. Et Mais moi, je demande au bloc. J'aimerais que le bloc commente là-dessus. Juste sur le tramway à Ottawa-Gatineau, euh, attendez, il n'y a toujours pas d'argent dans le budget pour le financement projet de tramway dans la région d'Ottawa-Gatineau. Qu'est-ce qu'il y a? Comme j'ai mentionné le tantôt, le volet d'études, il y a un volet d'études pour le Québec, la section Québec. Cet argent-là, il est déjà budgété. Donc, elle n'avait pas à être présentée dans le budget. Puis, on travaille pour la suite sur le reste. Merci. Ouais, ça va bien? Le, ça va bien, vous? vous avez euh, très bien. Vous avez le discours de Pierre, Paul Saint-Pierre Flamondon -Flam euh, au Québec sur la souveraineté? Bien, honnêtement, je n'ai pas vu tous les détails. Vous savez, on avait un budget fédéral à présenter. 
Mais honnêtement, je vous dirais, là, moi, je parle aux gens, là, c'est les questions de référendum, là, c'est pas ça qui... Quand vous êtes à la table de cuisine, là, les gens vous parlent de l'abordabilité, vous parlent de logement, vous parlent de croissance, c'est ce qu'on a présenté. Je peux... Moi, je vous dis, là, les gens à qui je parle là, dans la rue, ils ne me parlent pas de référendum. Mais lui, lui, ce dont il parlait, c'était des, des arguments historiques, donc euh, des, euh, des déportations, l'interdiction d'avoir okay. l'instruction en français. Il disait, M. Trudeau voyons poursuit l'œuvre. Mais, ben, mais, mais voyons donc. Non, non, mais je vous le dis, mais voyons donc. Mais tu sais, les gens chez eux, regardent ça, ils disent, mais voyons donc. Mais voyons donc, on sait qu'on est rendu. Quand on regarde le Québec, on regarde le Québec en avant. Moi, je veux dire, je ne regarde pas dans le rétroviseur, je regarde dans le pare-brise. On est en train de regarder pour bâtir un... le, le Québec. On s'inspire du Québec. Toutes les politiques à regarder dans le budget, moi, je l'ai toujours dit, le prix unitaire à l'épicerie, ça vient du Québec. Les garderies, ça vient du Québec. L'assurance médicaments, ça vient du Québec. Écoutez, on nivelle par le haut quand on regarde ce qui se passe au Québec. Tant mieux, moi, je suis fier. Au lieu de se sentir méprisé, on dit au contraire, on est chanceux. On, on inspire le reste du pays. Inspirons. Ça ferait le quoi, Québec. Le troisième référendum, puisque là, il y a mes collègues anglophones là, qui, qui, qui ouais. m'intéressent. Il faut que j'aille parce que je m'en vais en direct à Alec Castonguay. Il ne va, va pas être content, je suis en retard. Ben, en anglais, en anglais, c'est le ça référendum. Ça serait quoi un troisième référendum? Est-ce qu est que le oui. Québec peut se faire? Est-ce qu'on a le temps? Est-ce qu'on a vraiment le temps, puis vraiment, de se préoccuper de cette question-là? Moi, je vous dirais, je pense que les gens, alors qu'on a une opportunité générationnelle d'investir, on parle de croissance, on parle d'équité intergénérationnelle. Moi, je pense que c'est ça que les jeunes parlent. Moi, les gens, les jeunes à la maison, donnez-nous une chance, nous aussi, de faire partie de la classe moyenne. Connaissez-vous un jeune qui vous a demandé si on veut faire un référendum? Moi, j'en connais pas. Can you just a little bit in English? In English, on Est-ce que la question constitutionnelle est réglée? Écoutez, dans un pays comme le nôtre, on doit toujours regarder en avant. Moi, c'est ça que je dis. Moi, je dis ce que les gens... Euh, sont préoccupés aujourd'hui, c'est exactement ce qu'on a fait, l'équité internationale. Si on non, veut donner la, une chance que la à tout le monde, c'est là. Est réglée? Ben, je vous dirais, il euh, y a peu de gens moi, que je connais. Là, faites le tour avec moi. Là. Si on pas sort ça, tantôt, question, non, mais je vous dis, vous, elle est si, si on sortait tantôt dans la rue, est-ce qu'il y a beaucoup de gens qui vous parlent de construction? Les gens répondre. nous parlent. Non, je vous dis exactement. Moi, je suis là pour représenter les gens. Il n'y a pas vraiment, il n'y a personne qui me parle de construction présentement. Les gens me parlent de croissance, ils me parlent d'abordabilité, de logement. C'est pour ça qu'on est là. Moi, je regarde en avant, je ne regarde, regarde pas dans le rétroviseur, je regarde dans le pare-brise. Je veux dire, les gens regardent en avant, ils ne regardent pas en arrière. The EV tax credit, is it going to get home It's a good news. Is that, is it's that, good news. It's, it's good news. We're just going to bring more investment in, in Canada. That's good news. This is about gonna, bringing, gonna, listen, you know I talk to everyone. Yeah, but, but I think it's good news. Yeah, listen. But it's good news. They say Canada is, is the flagship now in the EV, and, and the more tools we have in the toolbox, the better it is, because we've been singled out as the country which is attracting most of the investment in the EV world. That's good. You know, we want to create growth, we want to create jobs, we want to create prosperity. Can I get a little English on PSP, uh, PSP Key's <laughs> idea about a referendum? Maybe just I, I would say no one is talking about referendum in, in this country. Yeah, well, listen, if you and I take a walk in the street, I'm not sure you'd find a lot of people talking about that. We're not going back in the rear view mirror, we're looking at the... We're looking ahead. You know, we're, we're a strong country. Uh, Quebec has been inspiring a number of policies in this country. We should be proud. You know, think about childcare, think about um, uh, what we've done with respect to, for example, food prices and consumer protection. Quebec is, has been always with very progressive policies that we are emulating in the rest of the country. This is good. We should be proud. Yeah, Quebec is inspiring the rest of the nation. That's a good thing. We should be proud as Quebecers. So for you, merci. merci, merci. Talk about the changes you've announced today. What do they mean? Sure. Well, the changes today mean that we have a new pathway. Uh, so the dentists who don't want to go through the avenue of a participating advance uh, can use the uh, the system on a, a one-off basis. We heard from a lot of dentists who had concerns uh, that it might, uh, you know, burden them with some future obligation or that we might make a change that wouldn't be beneficial for them. So some felt more comfortable just being able to interact with the program uh, as a one-off. Put the system, put the information in, uh, and then they can use it again or not use it again as they wish. Uh, so, you know, I've been having uh, meetings every day with uh, dentists all across the country. Um, this was really important to them. I think it's going to vastly expand uh, the number of people participating. Does this mean the dentists have to take part in the program or does it mean, can, can a patient still go to a dentist and then say, no, no, I'm not part of that, I'm not doing that? Uh, so I, what I'm hearing is, uh, is, is very positive. I think the vast majority of dentists are going to participate. There may be a, uh, some that don't, uh, but I think the vast majority will participate. There may be some instances where those dental offices are full. They have too, they have too many clients. They can't take any more. Uh, but, you know, 
it, that's going to be a particular concern for rural and remote communities. We anticipated that from the beginning. That's why we created the, the Oral Health Access Fund uh, so that we can work on expanding the number of oral health professionals that are available. I would also encourage people to look at hygienists. Uh, most of the time, uh, you don't have to see a dentist. You can just see a hygienist. They can uh, clean, uh, give you the, the, the cleaning that your mouth uh, needs, make sure that your microbiome in your mouth is in a good place, um, and we'll refer you to a dentist if more work needs to be done. Alors, je ne suis pas certain de bien comprendre ce qui va changer. Si euh, un patient va chez un dentiste et lui dit, après qu'il ait eu les traitements, euh, je vais vous payer à travers le régime fédéral, est-ce qu'il va pouvoir faire ça ou pas? Oui, c'est jamais une occasion où le patient, le patient va payer pour le service. Ça ne va, va, ça va jamais arriver. C'est tout le temps les responsabilités pour les, les dentistes euh, de travailler avec Sun Life de s'assurer que les, les, les paiements euh, vont arriver. Euh, alors, euh, le paiement va arriver moins de deux jours. C'est un processus vraiment rapide et électronique. Mais avec la nouvelle façon de participer, euh, c'est possible de, de ne participer pas en avance. C'est possible pour quelqu'un d'arriver avec une carte, euh, de, euh, avec l'information euh, pour le plan, et la personne va recevoir l'argent, euh, ou pardon, le service, et le, le dentiste va recevoir l'argent. Donc, con... Concrètement, un citoyen pourrait aller chez son dentiste et lui dire « j'aimerais avoir les soins à travers vous, même si vous n'êtes pas inscrit ». Et le dentiste va pouvoir, comme pour avec un régime privé, il va devoir même lui donner les soins, c'est ça? Oui, exactement. C est, c est, c est, le système va fonctionner dans, dans exactement la même façon que le système privé. Euh, alors, c'est possible avec les cartes, avec les, le logiciel, le même logiciel que, qui, qui les, les dentistes l'utilisent pour le système privé. Euh, c'est le même système euh, qui euh, va fonctionner dans la même façon que tous les autres types d'assurance de, 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 privée. Et euh, alors, c'est un système vraiment simple euh, avec euh, presque aucune administration. Parce que pour nous, c'est tellement important de s'assurer que le les, les, les programme est aussi facile de l'utiliser que possible. Mais est-ce qu'un dentiste pourrait dire non? Oui, oui, c'est possible de dire non. Mais pourquoi? Euh, il n'y a aucune raison de dire non. Parce que c'est si quelqu'un, c'est possible aujourd'hui, si quelqu'un arrive avec euh, l'assurance privée, euh, c'est possible pour le dentiste de dire non, non merci. Mais pourquoi? Euh, c est, c est, c est, notre système va fonctionner dans exactement la même façon que tous les autres types d'assurance. Alors, ce n'est pas logique de dire non. Can I just get you in English? He's like, you're just answering this in French. So you you don't put money up front in the system? Like what, There will what? never be an occasion, never be an occasion where we will allow patients to pay up front. That's been a red line for us in these discussions. Look, dentists uh, are uh, dental providers that I'm talking to, hygienists and denturists. We're all on the same page. We want to make sure that patients get access to service. And when you make a patient pay up front, these are often very vulnerable people. You get a senior who has $25,000, $30,000 in income. They don't have the money to put up front uh, the cost of their dental care. So that's been a red line for us. That's something we can't move on. And for the most part, that's been accepted. So what we've created is a very simple process. It'll work exactly like all the other insurance plans will work. They will use the same computer program that they use for the private system. They put in the claim. In, uh, in over 90% of the cases, they're going to be paid uh, in less than two days. In those remaining cases where, where there's more complex oral health needs, we have a pre-authorization process. We're making that incredibly simple. So for example, when you uh, need to prove that a procedure is done, that you uh, are going to be able to electronically submit your, uh, your x-rays instead of having to send paper or have it be some burdensome process just to make sure that, of course, those needs are actually needed. We have to guard taxpayers' dollars and make sure there isn't malfeasance. So there, for the more complex needs, we need verification that those procedures need to be done. And do you have any idea what the, I mean, you said there's 5,000 professions. Do you know how many dentists that is at this point? Almost I guess... all of them are dentists, yeah. So because a lot of the, 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 uh, the hygienists, uh, I mean, it really hasn't been an issue for the hygienists. We have a couple of issues to fix. Uh, we're going to fix them. Uh, I, and I think that the hygienists are, uh, are participating too one, I think expecting every hygienist to be participating. With the denturists, we're seeing uh, the denturists similarly, I think are going to be participating in extraordinarily high numbers. So almost all of those numbers are dentists. But what I would say is that with the alternative pathway, 
uh, there's really no reason for a dentist not to participate. It's completely illogical. It will operate just like any other system, any other plan. And what I'm saying to dentists is try it once. Uh, this program allows you to just put in the card number, get reimbursed as of July 8th, and, uh, and then once you see how easy it is and how it functions like any other insurance plan, uh, then keep doing it. And you can use it as a one-off. There's no need to commit to anything. There's no need to uh, actively indicate your participation. La préautorisation des soins, quand c'est des soins plus complexes, les dentistes vont quand même devoir euh, soumettre une proposition, disons, et qu'elle soit approuvée avant de faire les soins, c'est ça? Yeah, oui, oui. Uh, so, avec les préautorisations, il y a une obligation en avance d'offrir l'information, de s'assurer que oui, il y a un besoin là pour le service, mais s'il y a une urgence, une situation avec une urgence, c'est possible d'obtenir l'autorité et l'autorisation après le service. Alors, il y a une, une occasion pour ça aussi, uh, mais s'il n'y a pas une urgence, uh, c'est préférable de, de faire ça en avance. And when's this all, when, when is this up and running? Is this, this now? July 8th. Uh, so, we have, in May, we have uh, thousands and thousands of dentists, hygienists, and, and dentures who are going to be starting with those first seniors in May. Uh, and then in July 8th, we have this new portal, so we're going to be seeing a lot more dentists and providers coming on on July 8th. And then pre-authorization, which is those more complicated needs, that's going to be happening. Um, that's going to be happening in November. Perfect. Perfect. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Cheers.